Good evening. Welcome to Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. Tonight features a discussion between professors Richard Dawkins and John Lennox, both of the University of Oxford. Now, this is not the first time that these two men have met. Indeed, they debated one another last autumn in Birmingham, Alabama. In that encounter, the Wall Street Journal said that they displayed rhetorical skills in the best British tradition. The theme this evening is, has science buried God? Now, there are three topics of conversation. First is the issue of science itself, gaps and faith and evidence and so forth. And then finally, they will move into the topic of morality and purpose. If there is no God, where does that leave us? Now, we'll give this discussion roughly 50 minutes, and then there will be a Q&A. Um, we will be collecting questions from the seated area right here and then submitting them to the two men on stage. This will take about 20 minutes or so. And then we invite the media to withdraw to the uh, lecture room upstairs where these two gentlemen will meet with you briefly before coming down for a book signing. So this will give those of you here in the audience an opportunity to purchase a book, um, to queue up, and to meet these men who are on the stage. Now we do apologize for a lack of seating. Um, you will uh, agree with me, however, that this is a wonderful venue in terms of its beauty and its history. Um, I should also note that there is, uh, there is no um, unauthorized photography or filming of any kind. And indeed, tonight's event is being filmed, so your presence is an acknowledgement that you understand that and that you are okay with that. We do encourage you to move around the gallery. There are still some places behind us here that you can see and perhaps here also in the gallery. So do not crowd in, in these spaces here. We thank the museum. We thank Richard Dawkins and John Lennox for their willingness to participate. Uh, they're both very busy men. Um, Richard has this week his Simone valedictory lecture, which is a very important lecture for him. This takes place on Thursday night at the Oxford Playhouse. Would you like to say a word or two about that? I've been in the Simone professorship for uh, about 12 years. For the last 10 years, I've had um, an annual lecture by a distinguished scientist, uh, which I have organized. And that is coming to an end this year because I'm giving it myself, uh, no longer distinguished. Um, and uh, that's this Thursday. It'll be my farewell. Uh, it will be the 10th of the Simone lectures. Uh, and I hope it'll be a grand um, uh, gala occasion. Unfortunately, it was sold out about two months ago. Um, so I don't know why I'm plugging it, really. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds very exciting. And, uh, and, and John Lennox, you are, um, have been busy preparing a new edition of your book. That's right. The book's called God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God, which is, in fact, the title of our discussion this evening. And I'm trying to respond to comments people have made and to extended a little bit. It'll come out with Lion Hudson, I hope, in the new year. Well, very good. Well, gentlemen, we will begin here. But first, I want to remind you that, um, that we have to stay on schedule, and the T-Rex is actually mechanized. So if you, um, if you get out of bounds, um, we, we do have men who will operate that. So we'll begin with, uh, with Richard. Um, Richard, the question as we begin is, has science buried God? Well, which God? I mean, we could take Einstein's God, which is not really a personal God at all, but which is a sort of uh, poetic metaphor for the mystery, that which we don't understand about the universe. We could take a deist God, a sort of God of the physicists, a God of somebody like Paul Davies, who devised the laws of physics, God the mathematician, uh, God who put together the cosmos in the first place and then sat back and watched everything happen. Uh, and that would be, a, the deist God would be one that I think it would be, one could make a reasonably respectable case for that, not a case that I would um, accept, but I think it is a serious discussion that we could have. The third kind of God is one of which there are thousands and thousands of varieties, Zeus and Thor and Apollo and Amun-Ra and Yahweh. And uh, we don't actually need to go through all those because I've, um, as Larry has said, I've encountered John Lennox before and I know 
what he, the, the God he believes in, which is the Christian God. So we only have to talk about the Christian God. John Lennox is a scientist who believes that Jesus turned water into wine. A scientist who believes that Jesus somehow influenced all those molecules of H2O and introduced proteins and carbohydrates and tannins and, and alcohol and turned it into wine. He believes that Jesus walked on water. I had been accustomed to debating with sophisticated theologians and I come across John Lennox, who is a scientist who believes in all those things. In particular, he believes that the creator of the universe, the God who devised the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics, the physical constants, who devised the parsecs of space, billions of light years of space, billions of years of time, that this paragon of physical science, this genius of mathematics, couldn't think of a better way to rid the world of sin than to come to this little speck of cosmic dust and have himself tortured and executed so that he could forgive himself. That is profoundly unscientific. Not only is it unscientific, it doesn't do justice to the grandeur of the universe. It's petty and small-minded. And that's the God that John Lennox believes in. Well, Richard, uh, thank you for explaining so clearly, at least in part, what I believe. Um, I'm glad to hear you say that you feel a good case could be made out, that there is rationality behind the universe. You said it's not something you personally accept. So you believe that this universe is just a freak accident. There's no mind behind it. And yet, here you are with one of the best minds in the world. So, you believe a number of things that I, as a scientist, find very difficult to believe. And we can certainly talk about my specific Christian faith later, but I confess to it absolutely. I think that there is a creator of the universe. He created it, but he's not just a force. He's a person, and we are persons created in his image. And you say that God becoming human and Christ dying on a cross and rising from the dead is petty. I think the exact opposite. It's not petty because it deals seriously with the fundamental problem that I don't think atheism even, uh, even uh, begins to deal with, and that is the problem of our alienation with God. Of course, that makes no sense unless we believe in God. So I don't know how we should proceed. Perhaps the best way to start would be this. As a scientist, um, we both believe in the rational intelligibility of the universe. I believe the universe is rationally intelligible because there's a creator God behind it. Now, how do you account for the rational intelligibility of the universe? Well, John, you said that I believe that the universe is a freak accident, which is the opposite of, in, of, of what you believe. Um, for many years, uh, for many centuries indeed, it seemed perfectly obvious that it couldn't possibly be a freak accident because you only had to look at living creatures, the sort of magnificent diversity we see in this, in this museum, and everything looks designed. And so it was clearly preposterous to suggest that it was due to any kind of freak accident. Darwin came along and showed that it's not actually a freak accident, but nor is it designed. There's, there's a third way, which in the case of biology is evolution by natural selection, which produces a close imitation of something that is designed. It's not designed. Uh, we know that now. We understand how it, how it happened. Um, but it looks very designed. Now, the cosmos hasn't yet had its Darwin. We don't yet know how the laws of physics came into existence, how the physical constants came into existence. And so we can still say, is it a freak accident or was it designed? The analogy with biology might discourage us 
from being too confident that it's designed because we had our fingers burned before the 19th century in thinking that, that biology, which looks so much more obviously designed, uh, that we, we got our fingers burned there. Now, in the case of the cosmos, freak accident or design, the point that I've made over and over again is that even if we don't understand how it came about, it's not helpful to postulate a creator because the creator is the very kind of thing that needs an explanation. And although it's difficult enough to explain how a very simple origin of the universe came into being, how matter and energy, how one or two physical constants came into existence, although it's difficult enough to think how simplicity came into existence, it's a hell of a lot harder to think how something as complicated as a god comes into existence, difficult enough to think of how a deist god comes into existence, and even more difficult to think of how a Christian god who actually cares about things like sin and gets himself born of a virgin. Well, there are three or four different issues there, aren't there? there there's the question of what Darwin did and so on and so forth. But of course, as you have yourself admitted, as I understand it, Darwin didn't explain either the origin of life or the origin of the universe. And I would want to start there. You say we don't know how it came to be. But as scientists and cosmologists, physicists, we're studying it. And that very study and your own science assumes that the universe is rationally intelligible. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that atheism is saying that the thoughts in our minds are in the end only the results of a mindless, unguided process. Now, if that is the case, it seems to me that it's very difficult to see how they could tell us anything that is true about ourselves. I think it was Steven Pinker who said, wasn't it, that, that evolution has to do with reproductive success and nothing to do with truth. And John Gray, who's also an atheist, I understand, made the point not long ago that uh, the problem with uh, Darwinism, if you take it in its ultra form, it really undermines the um, notion that we can give any credence to what we think. So it seems to me that your atheism undermines the very rationality that I assume and you assume when we go to study the universe. So that's the first point I would make. Let me answer that. It, it seems to me a quite absurd thing to say that because we are saying that our minds are produced by brains and brains evolve by evolution, by natural selection, therefore that somehow undermines our ability to understand anything. Why on earth should that be? I mean, natural selection builds brains which are good at surviving and brains that are good at surviving are brains that are surviving in the world. But where does the concept of truth, how do they come to recognize things like truth if those thoughts are simply reducible to physics and chemistry and neurophysiology? How do they serve truth? Truth is what happens. An animal that, uh, that was attempting to survive and that didn't recognize truth or falsehood in some sense at whatever level is appropriate for the kind of survival that it has, it wouldn't survive. I mean, truth just means that you're living in the real world and you behave in the real world in such a way as things make sense in the real world. When you see a rock in your way, you don't go charging into it. You'd die if you did that. If you jumped over a cliff, you'd die. That's truth. It's perfectly obvious that natural selection would favor in any animal a brain that behaves in a, in a way that recognizes truth and acts upon it. Well, I can't help uh... I can't resist a little quip, but I notice many of my fellow human beings doing very well through telling lies. I can't for the well, life of me say... that's a separate point. <laughs> it's a separate point, but I can't see how natural selection would, would produce, this, produce this truth. But coming back to that in itself, you say this illusion of design, and of course I find your writing so... Um, fascinating because of the metaphors and images you use. I, I do envy that capacity. And you said somewhere that it's terribly, terribly tempting to believe that it has been designed. But the Darwin has shown us that this design is an illusion. But I've been very interested in the kind of thing that Simon Conway Morris has been saying recently, that 
If you take the evolutionary pathways, they're navigating through an informational hyperspace with phenomenal precision. And therefore, there is the impression of design at that level. I mean, if this mechanism that you talk about, which doesn't account for the origin of life at all, but let's leave that aside. If it is so phenomenally clever, then it itself is giving evidence that there's a mind behind it. The whole point of Darwinian natural selection is that it works without design, without foresight, But that's without an guidance. assumption. No, it's not an assumption. That is exactly how it works. Before, before Darwin came along, it looked perfectly obvious that even if evolution happened, there must be some guiding force to tell animals or plants how they ought to evolve. Natural selection is a blind force. The things that survive, survive. With hindsight, we can see that the ones that survive are the ones that are good at surviving. They have the genes that make them survive. Simon Conway Morris would not deny that. He's got some kind of, uh, well, actually, I rather share his, his view of uh, convergent evolution. We both of us are perhaps on the extreme end of Darwinians in that we emphasize the power of natural selection to home in on particular ends, particularly if you look around the museum, you'll see animals, marsupial animals from Australia that uncannily resemble non-marsupial animals. And Simon and I are both extremely keen on that. But that's produced by natural selection, as he would say. Natural selection is a mechanical, blind, automatic force. It is, it, it's not, I can't say it's not guided, but there's no need for it to be guided. It, the whole point is that it works without guidance. But it could be guided, or do you completely well, shut that out? I mean, why bother when you've got a perfectly good explanation that doesn't involve guidance? I mean, the why point is, you use, words like, you, lose, you use words like blind and automatic. This watch is blind and automatic, but it's been designed. The words themselves do not shut out that notion. And, and it seems to me that the, the impression I'm getting is that what's coming through is that the whole process is so sophisticated, it itself is giving evidence of a rational mind behind it. But am I understanding you right that you say you deny that because you have an in principle reason for denying it? That is, everything must, as far as you're concerned, go from the simple to the complex. And therefore, your major argument in the God delusion, if I understand it right, is that um, God is, by definition, more complex than the thing you're explaining, so he's got to be explained. Is, is well, that, that right? that is a major point that I, that I want to make. But let, let me go back to, to, to what you were saying before about, about guidance. Um, when you drop a stone, it, it falls to the ground, yeah. and, and you as a scientist will explain that by gravity. You, you wouldn't dream of saying, oh, there must be a God pushing it down. That's exactly what you're, in effect, saying with respect to evolution. Oh, uh, no, because, no, no, because no, no. Because we no. understand evolution in just the same kind of level as we, actually, rather better level than we understand gravity. No, I, I, and this is a very important point, because I detected in many of your writings that you oppose God and science as explanations. When Newton discovered the law of gravity, he didn't say, marvelous, now I can know how it works, I don't need God. God is an explicator at the level of an agent, not a mechanism. So that we can study mechanisms in biology. The more sophisticated they are, the more that might well point towards an agent. You don't argue away the existence of an agent by showing that there is a mechanism. And I don't quite understand how you manage to get, if I understand you right, God and science as alternative explanations. Well, I think you do get rid of, of an agent if the agent is superfluous to the explanation. That when, when um, you're studying something that's happening, there may well be an agent, and, it, and it may, if you're watching a, a car driving along and avoiding obstacles and turning left and turning right, you say, there is an agent controlling that car, and certainly there is, there's a driver. Uh, but if, 
if you don't need an agent to explain what's going on, and we don't in the case of biology, and we don't in the case of gravity. Of course, I accept that Newton was a theist. He lived in the 17th century and everybody was. But um, you don't need an agent. An, an agent is a superfluous explanation. It's a gratuitous grafting on of something that you don't need. Well, I find that unconvincing because even if you accept the whole evolutionary paradigm, well, it depends, it depends on there being a fine-tuned universe. And that fine-tuned universe raises in itself very big questions as to the origin of the universe. Evolution doesn't deal with that. No, it doesn't. Nor that. does it deal with the origin of life. No, th those are separate points. Those are separate points, things. but they're vastly major points. They are, yes. Um, as long as we were dealing with evolution, I was talking about evolution. If you want to move on to talk about well, these other I, things, I'd, be, I'm very, happy to do I'd so. be very happy to move on. But the, the notion of things in principle going from simple to complex, and they must go that way, that seems to me to be your belief, your faith. Well, things must go from simple to complex. Yes. No. I mean, if, if things go from simple to complex, we, we need an explanation. Yeah, we Natural do selection indeed. selection is an explanation for that. It's the explanation well, in the case of biology. Well, let's go back to the level of the origins of the universe and the origin of life. Now, life, as we both know, has got this digital database. Um, it's got a language all of its own. Now, the only thing we know of capable of producing language is mind. And yet you reject that. By definition, as an atheist, you must reject that. There's no but mind I do. behind this language. I do reject it. Um, when you say the only thing we know that can produce language is mind, I mean, we, we know that what produces human language is mind. Of course we do, because that's human language. But DNA is not human language. Yeah, but DNA it's very is sophisticated. It's it is given very us sophisticated, but it doesn't follow that it has to be generated by mind. But we know of no other conceivable way of it being generated. You see, because it, it seems to me from the mathematical point of view, I, I think you said this somewhere in a different context, junk in, junk out. Here we have this phenomenally sophisticated information processor, which is the cell. Am I really to believe that that information processing capacity simply came about by the laws of nature and random processes yes. without a mind. Yes. Well, absolutely. I find that impossible to believe I know as a you mathematician. Do. I know you do. Um, this is called the argument from personal incredulity. <laughs> <laughs> but I could just reverse that and say your position is the argument from personal credulity. No, that rationality comes from irrationality, that mind comes from matter. To, to, to me, the biblical explanation in the beginning was the word, the logos. That makes perfect sense. And it makes sense of the, of the fact that we can do science itself. But you haven't explained where the logos came from in the first well, place. Well, of course not, because the logos didn't come from anywhere. Well, then, in what sense is it an explanation? Because the notion that you say you have to ask who created the Logos, it, that says that you're thinking of a created God. The whole point about the God revealed in the Bible is that he was not created. He is eternal. He is the eternal Logos. And I ask myself, as an inference to the best explanation, which makes more sense, that there's an eternal Logos and that uh, the universe, its laws, the capacity for mathematical description, and so on, that these things are derivative, including the human mind from the logos, that makes very much more sense to me as a scientist than it's the other way around. When there is no explanation for the existence of the universe, do you just believe the universe is a brute fact? The universe is an easier brute fact to accept than a conscious creator. Well, who made it? <laughs> it's you who insists on asking that question. No, no, you but asked me who made the creator. The universe created you, Richard. Who made it then? A god is a complicated entity which requires a much more sophisticated and difficult explanation than a universe, 
which is, according to modern physics, a very simple entity. It's uh -huh. a very simple beginning. It's, it's not a negligible beginning, but it's a very simple beginning. That has got to be easier to explain than something as complicated as a god. Yeah, you can't explain the existence of God, but I, I think you may have missed my question. My, I'm drawing a parallel. You see, you say that it's at least, if, don't let me put words in your mouth, of course, because that would be unfair, but I'm getting the message that it's ridiculous for me to believe in a god who created the universe and me, because I have to ask who created God. All I'm doing is turning that question round and saying, the universe, you admit created you because there's nothing else. Well then, who created it? I understand you, you perfectly. I'm making the... You, we, we both of us are faced with the problem of saying, how did things start? Yes. I'm saying it's a hell of a lot easier to start with something simple than to start with something complex. That's what complex means. But I don't think so. If I pick up a book called The God Delusion, it's a pretty sophisticated book. It's got lots of words in it. But actually, as I look at page one, I don't even need to go beyond page one, I conclude that it comes from something more complex than that book itself, namely you. Yes. It, I mean, obviously, complex things exist, and brains exist. Well, and why can I not look at the universe, the whole show, which includes well, Dawkins I'll tell you and why. Lennox? I'll tell you why. Because my brain that produced a book has an explanation in its own right. That explanation is evolution. We go back and back and back to the origin of the universe. That provides an explanation for complex brains, and complex brains produce books and museums and cars and computers. Of course we have complex things that produce other complex things. But science has an explanation for where complex brains come from in terms of simple beginnings. I don't think it has at all. At the level of the origin of life, uh, reading the, the literature, even the recent literature, the word miracle comes up probably far too often for your liking anyway, that they're just going from, say, the self-organizational properties of low-level molecules that you got in some kind of primeval situation to the phenomenal self-organizational potentialities of macromolecules. There's just no way you can get there. Well, you've, you're asserting that there's no way. We don't yet know what it is because there's a lot of work yet to be done. Science doesn't yet know everything. There are still gaps. Yes, yeah, but I'm not ruling out the fact that there, there's a physical side to it and so on. But it seems to me that the fact that the basic description of this ancient language, and it's a very ancient language of DNA, points much more um, arguably to the existence of a logos, a divine logos who started it, than the notion that it's going to be exhaustively explained in purely naturalistic terms. Because I would still go back to the point I made earlier, although I don't want to harp on it. This extreme reductionism removes from me the very rationality which we use to have the discussion. So that I'm not simply terribly tempted to believe it's all been designed. I believe it's all been designed, but that doesn't, and here's something else that I'd like to bring up in this, that doesn't stop science. I fear sometimes that your dichotomy, either God or science, might put some people off science because they'd prefer God, and that would be a pity. Well, you're hopping around from one yeah. topic to, to another, but um, so we could do the origin of life, we could do the, the idea of, of, of miracles, the idea that um, somehow my approach to science puts people off. But, okay, let, let's do the last one then. Um, when, when you feel like it, you will, you will smuggle in magic. You will smuggle in magic for miracles in the Bible, you'll smuggle in magic for the origin of life. I don't, I can't explain the origin of life at the moment. I mean, nobody can, people are working but on it. But you believe that it will have a naturalistic solution? Uh, Yes, uh, I think that it is a cowardly cop-out to suggest that just because we don't yet understand something, therefore magic did it.
Oh, well, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the God of the gaps idea. Well, but you, that's exactly what you're putting forward, the God of the gaps. You're saying you're pointing to the origin of life, you're pointing to the origin of, of DNA and saying, oh, well, OK, we, Darwin's done everything after the origin of life, but he hasn't done the origin of life. No, that's what, the God of the gaps. I think what I'm saying here is that there may well be two kinds of gaps. That is, there are bad gaps that science closes. But could it not be that science can open some gaps? Now, what I mean by that is this. Your assumption, as I understand it, is that there's going to be an exhaustive, reductionist, naturalistic explanation of everything in scientific terms. I don't think so. Now, if there is a God, and if he created this universe, and if, as I believe, he is personal, then I would expect certain things to follow. One, that I would see evidence, not proof, but evidence in the universe that God existed. I feel I see that in the mathematical describability of the universe, in the fine-tuning of the universe, and so on, and in the marvelous sophistication of the world. I'd expect to, 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 to see God's traces there. I would also expect that there may be occasions when God speaks in special ways, and therefore the more we try to analyze those things in terms of purely reductionist science, it'll get more and more difficult instead of more and more simple. I wouldn't expect there to be many of those places. I think the origin of life might be one of them. And certainly when it comes up into more recent history, uh, you mentioned miracles. The thing that is central for me is the, the fact that uh, what you call petty, and I feel is, is vastly significant, because it's touching on something that affects every human being, the question of death. Now, if Jesus really literally rose from the dead as a matter of history, that makes an enormous difference to, to our view of the world. And so far from being petty, if this is God speaking to us, then I want to take it extremely seriously. Why do you think it's so petty? Well, of course it makes a huge difference if it's true. But yes, exactly. Suddenly, but you've suddenly leapt from uh, sophisticated discussions of the origin of the universe, where one can have a proper discussion about whether um, some sort of cosmic intelligence could have set forth the laws of physics. And you suddenly jump to a man who lived 2,000 years ago was born of a virgin, rose again from the dead. Uh, well, I only did that I, because you mentioned it well, first I at the beginning. Well, I think that's petty. I think that's petty uh, by comparison with the grandeur of the universe. I mean, to, to put my point again, do you really think that the, the creator of this magnificent edifice of the universe, these, the expanding universe, the galaxies, that he really couldn't think of a better way to get rid of the sins on this one little speck of dust than to have himself tortured. He's the one who's doing the forgiving after all. Couldn't he just have forgiven? Because this is a moral universe, Richard, and just forgiving doesn't make sense. You mean he has to kill himself in order he to... He doesn't kill himself. Or get himself killed, God, tortured. God, God sends his son into the world to provide forgiveness and to provide a basis on which he can justly bring uh, forgiveness to me. Now, he has to get himself killed in order to do well, that. Well, half a minute. We need to step back from this a little bit because it's actually a highly relevant topic. In your world, where is justice, justice to be found? Well, it's a, justice is a human construct of great importance in human affairs. And it's something that we have, most of us have a, a sense of, uh, which I think probably can be given some sort of Darwinian explanation. But I don't see where you're taking this. Well, uh, my question is, is there any ultimate justice? You see, you say this is petty. I'm saying I find myself in a world which is a broken world. I find myself in a world where there's massive injustice where many people won't get it. We're so privileged. We live in Oxford and so on. We've got enough money to live on, etc., etc. But if there is no God, then there's no ultimate justice. And one of the things that the resurrection 
transforms for me from pettiness right into center stage, is if this is true, then there's real hope that there be a rational evaluation and fair justice at the end of the world. But atheism doesn't give you that. Okay, suppose there is no hope, suppose there is no justice, suppose there's nothing but misery and darkness and bleakness, suppose there is nothing that we would wish for, nothing that we would hope for. Too bad. It, that doesn't make it true, just because God would make us feel good. Well, of course it doesn't. Well, then why do you make bring that argument up? Because I believe that there is evidence that it is true. I don't believe in the resurrection just like that, uh, because faith is based on evidence. But I've changed the ground again. What you, what you said before was that there is no hope without God. And it sounded well, that's true. Saying, that's absolutely true. Okay. And you've just admitted it. Uh, so I it, haven't admitted it. I said, if that's true, yes. so what? I didn't say it was true. But anyway, uh, but therefore, if that's the true, question so what? to be decided then is is there a God and has he revealed himself? And that's where, again, I think this pettiness needs to be pushed aside because I can't get to know you as a person. You're not just a scientific object. I can look at you through a, 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 a telescope or a magnifying glass. I could even dissect you and so on and so forth. But because you are a person, I cannot get to know you unless you're prepared to reveal yourself to me. So the fact that the claim of, of Christ to be the truth, to be God incarnate, that makes perfect sense to me, because if there is a God who invented this wonderful, marvelous universe with all its science and all the rest, then he has taken the initiative in getting to know us and revealing himself to us. And he's revealed himself to us at the level we can understand. We're persons, he's a person. That at least makes sense. So one of the very important questions to ask is, is that really true? Or is this simply myth and fantasy? Well, myth and fantasy for me. Yeah, well, do you know, that disturbs me for the following reason. Reading your book, The God Delusion, you say that it's under scholarly dispute among historians that Jesus actually existed. Now, I checked with the ancient historians. That is not so. And it disturbed me. History is not natural science. But what I don't understand is this, why you would write something like that. I don't think it's a very important question uh, whether Jesus existed. There are some historians, most historians think he did, some They certainly don't. do. I couldn't um, find an ancient historian that didn't. Uh, well, there are one or two, but I don't really care, actually, because it, uh, precisely because it's petty. I mean, I cannot, I mean, if you could, you could possibly persuade me that there was some kind of creative force in the universe, there was some kind of uh, physical, mathematical genius who, who created everything the expanding universe, devised quantum theory, relativity, and all that. You could possibly persuade me of that. But that is radically and fundamentally incompatible with the sort of God who cares about sin, the sort of God who cares about what, what you do with your genitals, the sort of God who, who, who is interested, who has the slightest interest in your private thoughts uh, and wickednesses and things like that. Surely you can see that a God who is grand enough to make the universe is not going to give a tuppenny cuss about what, you, what, what you're thinking about and, and your sins and things like that. So you think that morality is not important? Of course I don't think morality is not important. I'm well, a human it being. sounds like you're saying no, it isn't I'm a human, important. I'm a human being and I live in a society of human beings and within a society of human beings morality is of course important. But we are one of billions of planets on a huge scale. And a cosmic God who bothers about this kind of human scale is not the kind of God that is, is, that is compatible with a scientific view of the universe. It's a medieval view. But do you think that size is the measure of importance? Incidentally, on a logarithmic scale, you are about halfway between the atom and the universe. So if God thinks in terms of logarithms, yes. your point falls, I think. I mean, th this in, is, in a sense, an emotional argument we've, we've come into now. And, I don't think um, so at I, all. I want to... I want to if, if, if I were going to respect a God, it would be the kind of God 
who, the sort of God that Carl Sagan might have, might have worshipped, not the sort of medieval God who fusses about sin, the obsession with sin and, and righteousness and, and sort of, I, I keep coming back to this word petty and I stand by it. Well, it's, a, it's an image of God that I find uh, strange in a way. I, I gather from the BBC today that you're promoting some advert on London buses, uh, which is going to say something like, there probably is no God, um, so don't worry and enjoy your life. Now, I was very interested in that. Why don't worry? Do you associate the idea of God with worrying? I, I, I fought for a better slogan than that. This was... This was this was something that was, that was devised by, uh, uh, by a, a, a woman on the, on the Guardian, and she wanted to raise uh, money from five pounds here, five pounds there, to put this advertisement on the London buses. Um, I offered to match donations, and I said I'd rather change the slogan uh, to I'd not, from there probably is, isn't, is no God to there almost certainly is no God. And I didn't want to say, um, don't worry and enjoy your life. I wanted to say something like, live your life to the full. Uh, but it was too late to, ch to change it. And, and I'm, uh, since the, the money has been raised in the first day, um, something like uh, 23,000 pounds had already been, been raised, and she was only hoping for 5,500. Um, I'm going to get some say in what the next slogan is, and it's not going to say what the present one does. But from where I sit, you see, the thing that, that my relationship with God is the very thing that stops the worry and gives me the fullness of life. And we're back to the pettiness, because if God is real and has revealed himself, then it's, it's through a relationship with him that we really can enjoy a full life, science included. I find that so unconvincing. Yeah. Uh, I think there's something wonderful about uh, standing up and facing up to a universe where we are increasing our understanding, and we throw away childhood obsessions, we throw away the sort of imaginary friend that comforts us when we're children, and we, we feel the need for some kind of parent figure to, to turn to. I think when we, when we grow up, we need to cast that aside and stand up tall in the universe and it's cold and we're not going to last for it. We're going to die and we face up to that. And I think that's a nobler way of getting through life than to pin your hopes on childhood illusions. But that all rests on the assumption that there's no God and their childhood delusions. Yes, well, we have but to. But I could invert evidence. that. That's yeah. a, a typical Freudian explanation, yeah. but one's atheism could be exactly that. Yeah. A flight away from the reality that there is a God. So we're back to the question, inevitably. We need the evidence. We need the evidence. Mm. And what I'm suggesting to you is that we do have evidence. We have it in science, part of God's revelation. And I believe this building was probably dedicated to the glory of God. No, it wasn't actually. Wasn't it? No. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Rather the reverse. <laughs> well, Oxford University, yes. where we yeah. get That's going our, back a few centuries. Yes. Yeah. The, the Lord mm -hmm. is my light uh, and my illumination is, is, is the base of it. And there was that wholeness of life. And it seems to me that by truncating everything and putting it into the science basket, so to speak, that I get the impression that you're not taking history really seriously. Otherwise, you'd interact with it. And I'm trying to get to the basis of why that is so, because you regard what Jesus has done and who he is as petty. And I find the contrast between standing tall in a silent and cold universe with no hope, believing that your moral sense must ultimately be illusion, you're crying for justice because most people will never get it because death ends everything. The contrast between that and enjoying the friendship, the personal friendship of God and knowing that ultimate justice will be done is immense. Well, of but course the basic it is. question is, 
Is it true or not? Yeah, that is the basic question. It is completely irrelevant if it's comforting, if it gives you hope, if it gives you happiness. That has nothing to do with whether it's true. That I agree um, with okay. entirely. So, so we need to know uh, whether it's true. Yes. Now, um, when you look at history, and uh, let's, let's leave aside, may, maybe I, I, I alluded to the possibility that some historians think Jesus never exists. I take that back. Jesus existed. However, if you're going to say that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Jesus walked on water, that he turned water into wine, that is palpably anti-scientific. There is no evidence for that. And if there were, you would be, well, I mean, no, th there simply isn't any evidence for that, and no, no scientist could possibly take the idea seriously. I can make it worse for you. I know you can. <laughs> because Jesus actually claimed to be the Logos that created the whole universe. And if this is the creator incarnate, making water into wine and so on is really a triviality. The, the, the more fundamental thing is the fact that he claimed to be and gave evidence that he was God. When you say it's anti-scientific, I don't think it's anti-scientific at all. Science cannot say that miracles do not occur. It can say they're highly improbable. But Nobody is claiming that these things occurred by natural processes. They, they occurred because God fed his power in. Nor did the whole universe, uh, if we look at it, occur in that sense by natural processes. God created it. We study all the natural processes within it. So when you say it's anti-scientific, I think it's not anti-scientific. What I mean by that is that if and when doing science, we constantly have to keep in mind that at any moment, there might be a little magic trick slipped in. That would completely nullify the whole enterprise of science. Oh, I agree with that. But well, you that, see, but that's but what this you're is, allowing them. No, no, I'm not allowing that at all. Because in order to recognize what the New Testament calls miracle, a special act of God, you must be living in a universe that has regularities and that we recognize them. I agree with you entirely. Otherwise that's you wouldn't why, notice the miracles. But, that's yeah. exactly true. Yeah. You wouldn't recognize if dead people were popping up all over the place. You wouldn't think it was very special. But the fact is you need two things, not one. You've got to have rec regularities which we call the laws of nature, although they're not causes. They're, in a sense, descriptions that we can use. You also need to be able to recognize those so that, for example, when um, Joseph discovered that his uh, wife-to-be, Mary, was pregnant, he simply didn't believe her story. He was going to divorce her. He knew exactly where babies came from. He knew the regularity. It took very special convincing for him to realize that something extremely special had happened. But science cannot stop that. The question is, of course, did such a thing ever happen? And the central focus in the New Testament is not that, which is not so readily accessible to evidence, the virgin conception, but the resurrection of Christ. And ancient historians, and it's fascinated me recently going over it, ancient historians whose discipline is very venerable, and I'm not talking about Christian ancient historians, ancient historians, many of them, even at the skeptical end of the spectrum, say that the evidence for the resurrection of Christ is very powerful. The explosion of the Christian church from a non-proselytizing group of Jews in the first century, the empty tomb and all the rest of it, has even led Geza Vermesh, who's one of the most distinguished ancient historians in Oxford, to, to say, yes, this tomb was empty, and hallucinations and this kind of explanation do not wash. So, we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to believe in historical testimony or not? Well, you must talk to different historians than the one I talk to, but, than the ones I talk to, but, but um, in, in any case, I, I, I still come back to the point that you cannot do science if at any time you, you, you remember that famous cartoon of the... Oh, the, I do. The, the, and the, and, a miracle and, happens and the miracle in the middle of the equation, yes. I mean, that is... That is deeply against the spirit of science. And I, I don't think I could do science if I thought that at any time something like the resurrection, something like the virgin birth was going to be smuggled in by a, by a, a godly caprice. But let, me, let me stop you right there, gentlemen. Uh, we, uh, we need now to move on to the last 
topic, and we, we haven't left ourselves a great deal of time here, and that's the issue of, uh, of meaning, uh, human life, and meaning and purpose, and morality. You've kind of touched on morality just a bit, but it was only briefly, so let's, uh, let's move the conversation there, and then we'll have our Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> He's brought us to a complete stop, hasn't he? <laughs> the T-Rex is warming up. Yeah. Well, well, we, we, we have well, talked a bit about uh, We about have morality. talked a bit about meaning too, haven't um, we, really? Well, me meaning is, is something which uh, obviously scientists like to find, and we like to find meaning in things. We like to, uh, to understand things. Um, and as I said before, uh, brains are selected to be functional, to work well in the real world. And one of the things that makes them work well from the survival point of view is to find meaning and correct meaning, to, to interpret the facts of the world in a way which fits in with what's going to happen next, for example. So you, you don't jump over a cliff because you understand the meaning of jumping over a cliff is that you're going to die. Um, so uh, meaning is something that human brains appreciate, and meaning is something that scientists appreciate in a more sophisticated way. So what is the ultimate meaning of life for you? Uh, the ultimate meaning of life depends on uh, what you mean by it, obviously. Um, each one of us can make an ultimate meaning. We, each one of us can, can have a private meaning, a, a purpose in our life, a, um, what we hope to achieve in our life. Or a biologist might say the ultimate meaning of life is uh, the propagation of genes, uh, that would be a very different kind of meaning. They're both true. Mm. I suppose the basic question for me here is, what is the nature of ultimate reality? If ultimate reality is simply the universe, in some sense, or multiverse, that's one thing. And I am at a loss to understand how you get from simple atoms, elementary particles, and so on, to a, a brain, let alone a mind, the I, the person. And we don't understand what consciousness is, uh, and so on. I don't begin to see, and I don't think scientists begin to see, how you can get to something that even understands the concept of meaning. But I can understand it if behind the universe, the ultimate reality is not impersonal matter and energy that somehow has produced all this stuff bottom up. I can understand it if it's top down as well as partly bottom up, and that is that there is a God who is personal, who is good, who is the source of life and meaning, and who reaches out to me as a person, and who, in fact, far from stopping me doing science, encourages the development of the mind that he has given me. And so, meaning to me has all kinds of dimensions, as you would agree with, in my family, with my wife, and my children, and my work, and so on. But it's not bounded by the three score years and ten. It's not bounded by the the death of the universe either. It's got an expanding horizon of hope. And that, to me, is the only thing that is worthy of the God that created this vast cosmos, that our li lives are not going to be extinguished just like that. There is a beyond, and I can walk with confidence into that beyond because I have a real relationship that's got a firm basis with the God who invented it all. And Therefore, it seems to me that the, the meaning given by atheism and reductionism is very, very tiny. Now, of course, you'll come back immediately and say it's a question of truth. Of course, it's a question of truth. But at least we can have a look at the different kinds of worlds that we represent. Because that business of it's tempting, it is terribly tempting. Do you ever get terribly tempted to believe that there is a God and that the kind of thing I'm saying is I've true. I've said to you already that it, there are many things that would be very nice about it, but as you've just repeated, it doesn't make it true. No, it doesn't. I mean, uh, you think you're going to survive your own death, I gather. Yes, I do. Yeah. I mean, um, but so you think that even though your brain dies, something else, I mean, at what point in evolution did that remarkable f faculty emerge? 
oh, I, I haven't a notion. It's part of the, the uh, God has created human beings in his image. What on earth does that mean? In his image? Do you think he looks like us? No, no. Uh, well, what, that then? we have personality. That yeah. It's an anthropomorphism. Mm. But we are persons. God is a person. And therefore we can relate to him. That's was what the whole business is about. Person? Was Homo erectus a person? Well, I can't decide by looking at fossils whether it was a person but or do, not. But, do you, but think it you happened gradually? do you think it happened gradually? I mean, or, or was there a, a moment when a child was born that was a person and its parents weren't? I, my own feeling is that there was a point when God did something special, but it would be very hard to detect that from any scientific investigation. So God suddenly kind One of dived into the evolutionary process and said, right, from now on they're going to be persons. Well, whether he dived into an evolutionary process or did it specially I mean, you is, don't believe is in an evolution open question. Itself, or, or? I do believe in evolution as far as Darwin saw it, the variation and modification that we've been talking about. I'm not actually sure, but this is a vast topic now to begin. Gentlemen, I think, we, I think we digress. Yeah. Um, okay. The issue again is, uh, is purpose. I, I want to hear that ending. I want, I want to hear whether he believes in evolution. Well, I, I've said that I believe in what Darwin observed, but I'm not sure that the mechanism of mutation and natural selection can bear all the weight that's put on it. Uh -huh. For example, producing consciousness and so on. I think there may be several points in the history of um, the universe where God did something special. But I'm not going to be over dogmatic on that tonight because those aren't the places okay. where I rest my faith in okay. God. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. No, again, um, we still have a few minutes, but we're discussing this issue. Um, how, do you feel that you've discussed sufficiently the issues of, uh, of, of purpose, human purpose? You're actually giving a lecture um, on that in, a, in two days. Uh, and also the issue of morality. Are, are you comfortable that you've discussed that? Yeah, I think we should go to questions. Okay. What well, very good. Are? Yes? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the first question is for, uh, is for Dr. Lennox. And it is, excuse me, Professor Lennox. How do you explain the similarities between organized religions and why do you feel that the Christian faith is in some way more viable than the others? That's a question for me? Yes, indeed. How do I explain the similarities between organized religions? I think that when we look around the world, there are various aspects to any given religion. And one of the very important ones is the moral aspect. And as has been pointed out by many people, if you look around the world, you find a common moral pool. In fact, you mentioned this in your book, a common moral pool that people of all faiths or none will respond very similarly to the same kind of moral questions. Now, to me, the explanation for that is the one I've just given, that each person is a moral being made in the image of God. And therefore, as I look around the world, I would expect whether people believe in God or not, that they have a roughly similar morality. So there are similarities at that level. But then you will get very big differences when it comes particularly to the question of the basis for a relationship with God. And that tends to diverge. There are some religions that's, that say that a relationship with God must be based on human merit. And as many probably know, Christianity says the exact opposite, that the relationship with God comes through trusting Christ because um, of, of what he did uh, through his cross uh, and resurrection and is not merit but is a gift. I don't know whether you want me to expand further on that, but that's you, you, you've it. got You've got a bit of time, both of you do. If, if you, you, what you was can the take second a part of the question again? Just What's repeat. so special about Christianity? Yes, what, what distinguishes Christianity? What, what, uh, excuse me, why do you feel that the Christian faith is in some way more viable than the oh, other religions? I, I see, well, I think for me the question is, very aware of Richard sitting here to my right, is, is whether it's true or not. And Christ claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, and either that's absurd nonsense or else it's true. Now, I'm convinced it is true. Why is it true? Well, if we take the three great monotheistic religions and their attitude to Christ, we'll find that one of them believes that he died and didn't rise, 
The other believes that he didn't die, and Christianity believes that he both died and rose again. Now, that's something that I feel that we can access by history. The second point is this, and it's probably the most important point. It's that it seems to me in a way that Christianity is not competing with other religions. Let me try and explain that. Because as I understand the New Testament, what Christ offers me is something that no other religion offers me. Many religions offer me a very uh, a path, a moral path to follow, which may be excellent. But what Christianity offers me is a radical diagnosis, which some people react against. The, the fact that I find myself uh, disjointed, I find myself I don't even keep my own standards, and so on. And I find also that the relationship with God has been broken, and there is need for repair, there's need for forgiveness. Now, in Christ, in his death and resurrection, I find that there's an adequate basis for forgiveness so that I can be certain of my relationship with God and know it. Now, I don't find that anywhere else. I find wonderful morality and all the rest of it. And I think it's very important that we respect people of other faiths. But if you ask me what makes the difference, that's the central one. There are many others. Okay. Um, to Professor Dawkins, do you think that there is no purpose in religion? No purpose in religion? Well, as I said before, individuals have purposes, and many individuals have purposes that are deeply shot through sometimes literally, with religion. They are, there are people in the world, very large numbers of people, whose entire life is guided by religion. Everything they do is guided by religion. Uh, so the answer, of course, is yes, there are purposes in religion. Um, I think that it is a tragedy that people waste their lives devoting it to such uh, fanciful, imaginary purposes, but I can't deny that they do. Uh, over to uh, Professor Lennox. If we accept that an omnipotent designer is responsible for our existence, then how do you explain the deficiencies in our design? Well, of course, the question assumes that there are deficiencies, all, all design involves compromise with all kinds of different constraints and so on and so forth. So I think before I rush to say there are deficiencies in our design, I would need to know what the ultimate purpose of the designer was and all the rest of it. So it's very difficult to respond to that. Uh, I believe myself that the ultimate designer is God, but I also believe we live in a damaged universe. And so we see around us, alas, all kinds of things that are a result of, well, human evil as a result of the disjointedness of creation and so on and so forth. But that would lead us into a very much deeper question of the problem of moral evil and pain. To Professor Dawkins, how do you explain the origin of the laws of physics? I do not know the origin of the laws of physics, as I've said uh, again and again. Uh, what I do know is that whatever they are, and I've said this again and again, whatever they are, it certainly doesn't help to propose that they were designed by a conscious intelligence, because that simply makes a bigger question than you've solved. Now, the laws of physics, uh, to break that down a little, a little more, uh, it has been suggested that the laws of physics are extremely fine-tuned and that if they were any different, uh, the universe as we know it wouldn't exist, stars wouldn't exist, chemistry wouldn't exist, biology wouldn't exist, and we wouldn't exist. And theists are tempted to say, therefore, the laws of physics must have been designed in such a way that they are exactly fine-tuned to bring us into existence. Once again, that is a non-explanation because it leaves open the explanation for the designer. There are many physicists who uh, explain that by saying, well, with the so-called anthropic principle, saying that we could only exist in a universe which has the 
the right laws and the right constants to bring us into existence. And therefore, the fact that we're talking about it determines that we must be in such a universe. That's the anthropic principle. Uh, there are versions of it which make it a bit more plausible. For example, the multiverse theory that there are lots of different universes, that we live in a kind of bubbling foam of universes, and each bubble in the foam has a different set of laws of physics. The vast majority of those laws of physics are not conducive to giving rise to us. A tiny minority are conducive to giving rise to advanced life forms. And once again, the anthropic principle comes in, we could only exist, we could only be in one of those bubbles that has the necessary laws of physics to bring us into existence. And therefore, obviously, since we do exist, since we're talking about it, we must be in such a universe. I haven't answered the question, but what I hope I have done is to show that whatever else the answer is, it cannot be God. Okay, gentlemen, now what, what I would like to do, I want to give you um, ample time for your closing remarks. And so we will begin with Professor Lennox. Uh, you may take five minutes, no more than five minutes, and then we will conclude um, with Professor Dawkins. He will have the last word. Has science buried God? I think not. Science arose in the 16th and 17th centuries, a meteoric rise that historians of science have looked at and come to the conclusion that one of the main motors driving the rise of science was faith in God. So far from belief in God being a science stopper, it was the thing that caused science to rise in the first place, understandably so, because people had a basis for believing that the universe was rationally accessible, and so they could do their science, which is apparently one of the reasons given by Needham, the famous sinologist in Oxford, when he looked at China and asked the question, why did science not develop in this way in China? And in the end, although he's a Marxist, he came to the conclusion that it was because of the Christian background. So I'm not ashamed of being both a scientist and a Christian. And I suppose that the major argument that points, doesn't prove, but points towards God is that this universe is a universe in which science can be done. The fact that the laws are there. Richard honestly says he doesn't know where they come from. They come from the logos, the mind that is behind this universe that has created it by his power and for his glory. And therefore doing science, like Galileo and Kepler suggested doing mathematics, is to discover the secrets of the universe in the language in which God has written them. The other reason why I reject atheism as an explanation is it doesn't even, to my mind, begin to rise to account for the rationality which lies behind science. Also, I think that the Christian faith, which I uh, unashamedly espouse, is not anti-scientific. And I would plead for the same attention to be paid to history as is paid to science itself. I find very unconvincing um, arguments that uh, trip very lightly over things that historians do accept, which mean that we should take the scholarship that uh, has to do with the res the existence and the resurrection of Christ very seriously indeed. The other big area, which we didn't discuss in great detail tonight, is that if science has buried God, it seems to me there's something else that uh, lies before us, and that is where are we going to get our morality from? Because uh, Richard has written in one of his books that the universe is just like we'd expect to find it if at bottom there's no good, there's no evil, there's no justice. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. That seems to me to be a frightfully deterministic uh, universe. And it, it, 
It troubles me to this extent because it seems to me that on the one hand, the new atheists, of which Richard is a leader in the world, are trying in a way to hold on to the values that were given to them by Christianity, actually. And I would like to emphasize that because in many of these books, nothing good is said about religion. But Jürgen Habermas, who's not a Christian, of course, recently said that the foundations of our legal system and our education and our morality in Europe are based on Christianity. Everything else is postmodern chatter. What worries me is this, that can you really retain these good moral values and espouse atheism? Hard atheists like Nietzsche and Camus would say you can't. Eventually, it will lead to madness. And some people are suggesting that that is actually what's going to happen. And I have a question for, for Richard Dawkins. Is his world the world of Peter Singer, where in the end, moral values get so eroded by a, a naturalistic framework that Peter Singer can say, a newborn baby is of no more value than a pig or a dog or a chimpanzee. Is that the world to which the new atheism is leading us? Peter Singer is one of the most moral people I know, and when he says something like that, it is based upon uh, a very rigorous moral philosophic reasoning. He's interested in suffering, and his point is there that a, a newborn baby, or certainly a, a, a human fetus, may be uh, more, less capable of suffering than, say, a, a full-grown pig. Uh, that seems to me to be an entirely rational point of view, at least an entirely defensible point of view. However, it was tossed in at the last minute, and I don't want to take all my time dealing with that. Um, John, you quoted me as saying the universe has at bottom no good, no evil, um, and you said uh, it, it has exactly the, the properties we'd expect if there, if there was nothing there. Um, you said that sounds horribly deterministic. Well, another way of putting that would, would be to say that the universe is uh, uh, horribly rational, horribly intelligible. And one of the main points you've been making is, that, is precisely that, that we, ha we live in an intelligible universe. And that's one of the things that we need to explain. And you think it needs a God in order to explain it. What I would like to know is what would an unintelligible universe look like? How could any creature live as we live? How could any creature have evolved and survived in a universe that didn't have that kind of mathematical intelligibility. It's the anthropic principle again. Just as we could only be living in a universe that has stars, because you need stars to make molecules, so we could only have survived in a universe where there is rationality. I cannot conceive of what an, an, an irrational, um, unlawful universe would look like. Now, science doesn't know everything. So it's one of the glories of science that we know what we don't know, and we work on what we don't know, try to shrink what we don't know. It's hard work. We don't cop out by saying, oh, well, if you come to a difficult problem, magic must have done it, or God must have done it. No, we don't say that. We say, right, that's a problem to be solved. It may not be solved this century. It may be solved in the following century, or the one after that. But we don't just lie down and give up and say, oh, well, it must be magic, because we don't yet understand it. I would hold up Darwin as a model for the whole of science, because before Darwin came along, the whole of life, the complexity of life, the beauty of life, the elegance of life, the apparent design of life, looked like magic. And everybody thought it was magic. Everybody thought that God did it. It's so complicated, it's so elegant. Now, that was the really big problem. That's a, that was a far bigger problem than the problem of the origin of life than the problem of the, cosm of the origin of the cosmos. Darwin solved that problem. All scientists now know that. Darwin solved that problem, and in so doing, he provided us with a sort of parable that don't even think about giving up, because if ever there was a time to have given up, it was in the case of biology, because biology really was a difficult problem, a hard problem. Darwin solved it. Now, we have one or two other problems remaining, like the origin of life, 
like the origin of the cosmos, the origin of the laws of physics. No doubt that there are physicists here who can point to yet other ones. Darwin provides us with a lesson that says, don't give up, because if Darwin could solve it for the really difficult problem, which was life, then we have every hope that science will solve it for the other problems in the end. And even if it doesn't, even if science doesn't solve all problems ever, that is still no grounds for saying, oh well, magic did it. Well, gentlemen, thank you so very much for providing us with a very elegant model for engaging on these very difficult issues. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking them. Thanks, Richard.